Uh, hi, so my name is Ben Dalton, and uh, I, I want, what I want to talk about is a project that uh, I've already built, um, which was really trying to allow a room of strangers to share their free mobile minutes uh, with someone, so through the power of a phone box. Um, but uh, in putting together this talk, what I found is that I was looking at um, what the phone box means to us culturally, uh, and I want to make a case for trying to keep the phone box going uh, as something that we can rely on. So um, this talk ended up being about what a phone box is, uh, and it's sort of this space, uh, a, a quieter space with semi-privacy. Uh, it encompasses something of, of anonymity in terms of communication. You can dial a number without having to verify your identity. Um, and then also, in, in the process of creating a new phone box that's sustained by a room full of strangers, by a community, um, I was interested in this idea of the phone box in a public space and what the effect of placing something into a public space and having that public um, sustain the common good, uh, what that does to the, to the phone box. Um, I'm a researcher at the Royal College of Art uh, and also a principal lecturer at Leeds Beckett University in the UK. And my main research at the moment is pseudonymity. And I'm interested in designing for pseudonymity. Um, and the phone box um, featured only very briefly in, in the kind of uh, history of Superman as a place to change from one pseudonym to another. Um, but I think the fact that it very quickly stuck in people's heads as the place that Superman transitions privately from one pseudonym to another uh, isn't a mistake. I think that's actually kind of a key feature of what phone boxes mean to us uh, as a culture. Um, and there's another thing that uh, I've been struggling with a little bit, and it's the tension uh, when talking about phone boxes between wanting to own them uh, as a subculture. So um, I think within this context, subculturally, we um, have a kind of great affinity to the phone box. It sort of represents something uh, uh, special to, ha to hacker culture. Um, but if you want to try and build uh, kind of rich, robust, usable, sustainable uh, pseudonym tools, um, or tools for anonymity in terms of communication. Um, if you're in constantly invoking this subcultural narrative around uh, phone boxes as being for hackers, um, then you're kind of pushing aside a larger community of users. And so the other argument I want to make in this talk is about um, designing for the mundane, sort of presenting things in, in a language of everyday use, rather than this kind of more exciting um, pirate kind of hacker culture. Um, and I'm sort of illustrating my talk for a large part uh, with clips uh, of phone boxes featuring in, 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 in popular media. And that, again, I think shows our affinity with this kind of representation of communication in an anonymous, in a private form, but in a public space. You're on view when you're using a phone box, but you're also kind of hidden away. Um, so a little bit of background to the project. Uh, I was invited um, by Drew Hemmett and the Future Everything team to submit an idea to their City Fictions uh, um, uh, exhibition. They run an annual event, the Future Everything uh, Festival, uh, in Manchester in the UK. Um, and the City Fictions was about a speculative um, but also um, functioning future city. Um, and I'd previously worked with Future Everything um, to, in the, the year before to create a project called Chatter, which was a public, a physical public space, a cafe with privacy uh, violating uh, um, uh, properties, a lot like Facebook and Twitter uh, in terms of their privacy policy and branding. Um, we used guinea pigs to um, um, draw people into sharing more than they normally would publicly and online. Um, so the uh, space in, in Manchester um, for the city fiction uh, was a, a, an empty uh, building um, and uh, I proposed to create the telecom system for this uh, city of the future. Um, and uh, what I wanted to do was to try and engage um, people to uh, create a resource between themselves. So by pooling the resources, these minutes that you get free with your uh, phone plan into a common resource, we can offer a, f a free phone service to anyone who needs to make a call. That was the idea, the proposal uh, to Future Everything. And here is a photo that sort of encapsul encapsulates the entire working system, uh, the experience of using that system in condensed into one image. Um, so this guy is uh, using the handset of the free phone box uh, to, to make a call. 
He's making a call to uh, just a random stranger somewhere, um, any low pay uh, phone number, so a, a landline or a mobile phone in the UK. Uh, in this case, it's someone in the same room, but that phone number could be anyone. Uh, and he's doing it by borrowing uh, minutes from uh, this guy's mobile phone. So this guy has um, chosen to allow the system to um, borrow call time from him. How does that work? Um, what I did was to ask people when they came and sat in the cafe if they wanted to, to connect their mobile phones to the system over Bluetooth using the um, hands-free uh, profile. So um, uh, on your phone, the system just looks like a headset or an in-car stereo system, uh, and you're just able to select it and pair with it, uh, and then the system chooses uh, one of the phones in the room to, to make the call. Um, as you can see here, the phone box um, is virtual. It's created with tape um, very quickly. Uh, and the whole project for me has a certain kind of feeling to it of the Fat Labs, um, Aaron Bartol's speed projects, in that each kind of component was try, you know, sort of attempted in quite a small amount of time. The phone box was certainly assembled in less than eight hours. Um, but a, a, as a project overall, it doesn't deserve this speed project approved stamp because um, things took longer than that. Um, so how did it work? Uh, as I said before, I was relying on this hands-free profile, which is part of the um, Bluetooth uh, specification. This uh, beautiful diagram is in the official documentation um, and shows that your phone, using hands-free, can connect to a headset but also to a car. Uh, and the difference between the hands-free profile at the bottom in black there and the one above it, the headset profile, is hands-free allows you to dial numbers as well, which is what you want to do. We want our um, phone booth to be able to connect to a phone and dial the number and have it um, pass through the audio in both directions. There's another profile there, SIM access, and that allows a much more control, access to phone books, um, control over the phone, and that's used in cars as well. But I steered clear of that one, it was slightly more complex, and I also worried about the security implications of, of kind of people handing over more control of their SIM to this uh, computer in a public space. How did I build the system? Uh, well, uh, I used a um, Debian installed on a, um, a sort of generic PC. Um, I used the stable uh, Wheezy uh, that was available at the time, and that dictated using uh, Blues, which is the Bluetooth stack, um, and uh, that dictated using Dbus as a, as a communication uh, channel um, between that and, and any other software that I was trying to control the hands-free profile with. Um, I found uh, Blues um, to be horribly documented. They delete their documentation when they move forward, and since they'd moved on from this version uh, in their, to their latest one, it was very difficult to actually discover how to um, change settings reliably. All of the things that people had written online before just weren't up to date enough, and so it was difficult to actually um, have the, the system respond in the way that it was documented online. Um, luckily, someone, uh, um, Sam uh, uh, Revich, uh, had uh, created a few years ago this implementation uh, of the hands-free profile server uh, for Linux called NoHands. Um, when you uh, read about this online, uh, the um, uh, project at the time is quite well documented. It has a back end and then a front end and a number of test programs to, to try it out. But over time, it's kind of um, fallen out of use and maintenance. Um, and there's a lot of frustration in, in uh, sort of car uh, modding forums trying to get this uh, program to work again. Um, there's been an attempt to fork it onto uh, GitHub uh, um, by a number of people, um, started by uh, Thomas Zimmerman, uh, and that's the version that I, I um, um, uh, started to, to play with. And uh, uh, even that, I was finding uh, I could get the program to run, but it was uh, unable to actually make the connection uh, um, reliably. I was able to make simpler Bluetooth connections like streaming audio in one direction, but actually creating this um, uh, hands-free profile uh, seemed a bit more complicated. Um, thanks to additional notes from John Tapsell, I was able to actually find some settings and, um, and uh, by going through several Bluetooth dongles, I uh, was able to find one that did actually work reliably with a number of uh, phones um, over Bluetooth. Um, the hardware, uh, like I said, was a generic PC. Uh, I uh, used a um, simple USB phone um, as the uh, audio input and output and also the keypad. 
Um, as you can see, again, everything's kind of stuck together with tape, and that's a running theme uh, throughout the project. For the software, um, so the PC uh, has um, the uh, no hands um, software running, um, and that's controlling uh, access to phones over Dbus. That's where the commands are, are being passed back and forwards to Blues. Um, and so I wrote three Python scripts that um, also sit on, on Dbus and um, uh, allow no hands to do most of the heavy lifting and then just um, throw commands in occasionally to do things like pairing with phones as they appear uh, in the vicinity of the, of the Bluetooth dongle um, and also to um, find the key presses and um, work out what calls to, to make. And the resource of all the phone numbers is built from the um, phones in the neighboring area in the cafe uh, of uh, Future Everything. I also found, uh, just to mention briefly, this app, um, Bluetooth SCO, tests to be quite useful uh, in actually trying to fine tune the, the settings um, to get the audio to re reliably play in both directions uh, on, on, the, on the phone. Um, I'm not going to show you much uh, in the way of the script because it's just some sort of, again, held together with tape pieces of code to kind of pass certain instructions over Dbus to Blues and to No Hands. Um, just two things to mention here. The big list of um, the beginnings of mobile phone numbers in the UK. It turns out that most um, free numbers or low-cost numbers on people's phone call plans uh, are um, easy to um, select by the first two digits, 01, 02, 03, and 07. Um, but there is a subset of numbers that look like normal mobile phone numbers, but are on uh, various islands that are affiliated with the UK, uh, Jersey, Guernsey, and the Isle of Man, and some call forwarding services that are premium rate, but just look like normal numbers. And so I'm, what I'm doing there is just building a white list and a black list of numbers to um, filter any uh, calls that are dialed so that I'm not passing expensive calls on to the donors um, who have offered up their free minutes. Um, I basically only want free um, to mobile users calls to go through. The other thing I'm doing there at the top um, is connecting to the USB handset. It turns out that, that wasn't um, supported as standard uh, on the version of Linux that I was using. And so I'm just using the um, uh, um, um, human interface device uh, raw uh, um, access to pull out the key presses and translate them into the numbers that are being dialed and the call button that's being pressed. So this is just um, um, storing in the dialed numbers and then um, filtering them and, and passing them on to the, the, uh, whichever mobile phone has been selected to make the call. So what we have here then is a functioning uh, um, uh, phone box that allows strangers to walk into a space, dial a phone number, uh, which in itself is a little bit strange. Um, if you grew up with uh, phone boxes, you probably, that feels quite normal. But now, uh, uh, sort of a newer generation of people aren't used to um, accessing people through numbers, but rather through address books and, and faces and, and IDs. Um, but what's interesting to me is that this system is sustained by a social group in the same space. So Bluetooth has a, like a range which is roughly room sized, which means that if this phone is to stay free and usable, there has to be a community, an active community of people willing to donate minutes to it. Now, I don't think the donation seems like much of a problem. Most people have more minutes that they can use. It seems part of the mobile phone contract to sort of lure you in with these minutes, and you never really use them up. So most people seem quite happy with that. Um, but uh, you know, maybe there's some other implications uh, around um, being a donor or being a, a, a phone, call, uh, phone box user. And I want to investigate those a little bit more. Um, so one uh, issue that I thought about a bit is this kind of issue of power. So um, the people who might sort of choose to donate minutes and the people who might choose to use a free phone box may fall into different groups. And that might be because it's like a pay-as-you-go contract versus a, a contract that gives you free minutes. It might be because you have no phone. Uh, homeless people might find the service particularly useful to use as callers. Um, travelers, again, maybe their phone doesn't work in another country. So you start to see this kind of weird separation between donors and users. And uh, I was worried a little bit about that, especially since phone boxes tend to put you on display. Um, if you haven't seen this for, uh, film, La Cabina, all of the references are down the bottom and the slides are online. It's about a, a man who gets trapped in a phone box. Um, 
So what are the benefits to a caller to coming in and, and using this, this free phone service? Well, obviously it's free, but there's another benefit as well, um, which is that it offers you some anonymity. If you place a call um, through your home phone or through your mobile phone, um, you are kind of um, have your identity tied to placing that call. If you go and use a payphone, um, you have slight, a slight anonymity in, in, in the communication. Um, the, the record is still made of where that call is directed to, um, but you're kind of reasonably anonymous, um, although of course you know, phone boxes are in public spaces and can be observed, but there is some degree of anonymity there. And certainly that feature reoccurs as a theme in films uh, as a way of um, delivering tip-offs and um, hacking and everything else. Um, and so there's an exchange there between some anonymity and public presence in this social space of a small group of people, which I think is interesting. Um, so in a way, this uh, free phone box is, using, is sort of um, mirroring the function of um, a uh, mixed network node. So uh, in a mixed network, the computer is taking email and forwarding it on and stripping the identity. And in our system, the free phone box is allowing you to um, take the things you're saying and pass them through somebody else's phone and sort of strip the ID away. Um, so in a way, it functions um, sort of like that. And so then we, we start to think, well, what's the benefit for the donor? If they're starting to serve this purpose, purpose of, of providing some anonymity, um, are they not worried about the implications of, of, of offering um, an anonymizing service to strangers? Is that kind of something that they might be worried about? Well, what are the benefits to donors? Um, one of the benefits, I think, uh, for me is that if you um, fill your phone record with the phone calls of strangers, what you start to do is to decouple the phone record from the, your identity. So um, the mobile phone, I think, gradually over time has become a symbol, uh, an authentication tool for identifying people. And if you can start to insert other people's phone calls into your record, then what you're doing is start to decouple uh, that relationship between you and your phone and your phone record. And I think there's an interesting property there that we should um, look at a little bit further. This is a brief um, uh, period a fad called phone box stuffing in the 1950s. It lasted a year. Um, and so to me, this, this is reminiscent of the idea of chaff. So Chaff, uh, it was called Window in the UK uh, during the war and Doppel in Germany. They, um, both countries invented it at the same time and didn't use it for several years for the fear that the other one might copy them. And the idea is that you're flying your plane, you drop a big cloud of small pieces of metal, um, little strips of metal, and as they sort of flicker through the air, they reflect radar, and you have this effect in the, um, in the radar system where you're unable to see the plane because there's all this reflection, this kind of small pieces of, of a distracting material. Uh, and what we're talking about when we're inserting uh, strangers' phone calls into our own personal identity record is we're inserting data chaff into our record and therefore kind of obfuscating the um, sort of form of our identity a little bit. And so this, I think, is an interesting idea in terms of controlling how your identity is, is monitored by other people or stored by other people. Um, so I, I want to talk about chaff a little bit more. Uh, one approach to chaff that I've seen come up a couple of times, this is the first time that I saw it uh, kind of uh, presented uh, effectively. This is the super villainizer um, by uh, Anya Rust uh, in 2002. And what this did uh, was to create fake uh, um, email characters who would have email conversations um, late at night using keywords uh, you know, about bombs and um, nuclear material and biological agents and um, assassinations of presidents and subways and all those things. Um, and because those keyword terms were passing backwards and forwards through this email system, they were sort of inserting this, this chaff into the system um, to kind of slow down the uh, automatic monitoring uh, and kind of complicate the monitoring uh, technology. Um, but one uh, uh, thought I had about algorithmic chat, chaff is that if you're creating it through some sort of uh, program pattern, it may be that it's just as easy to remove it again. So if you're kind of creating this thing um, just through uh, uh, sort of simple patterns, then maybe it's easy to filter it back out again. So the alternative, perhaps, is to create social data chaff. That's uh, chaff that's kind of created by human activity and therefore much harder to predict. 
Um, and my favorite example of that is uh, the um, NTK Extreme Computing Festival in 2002, uh, where they invited people to um, swap loyalty cards. There was a big box in the conference, and everyone who arrived put their shopping loyalty cards into the box, and then as they left at the end of the day, they took another one, and on their press release they said, imagine the data processor's bafflement when a healthy uh, eating family of four suddenly turns into a single 33-year-old male who consumes nothing but satsumas and ready meals. So again, there, you know, there's this idea of by um, inserting a stranger's life into your own, um, you're able to complicate the, the uh, records that people are keeping, um, but you know, by doing it in a social way, I think you kind of introduce this extra level of complexity. Um, and I think that's what the uh, free payphone is doing in a way, is it's offering social data chaff. So um, these strangers will uh, make arbitrary calls to places that you weren't expecting, and that starts to insert this kind of level of deniability. Um, now, the deniability isn't um, perfect. So you were definitely in the room uh, alongside this thing that offers this um, certain level of chaff. Um, so people could easily point to the other phone calls that you made at the same time and say, well, those were probably you and these were probably strangers. But if you repeated this phone box in a number of locations and you, and you um, put it places that you frequented often, cafes, libraries, workplaces, you know, across from your home, you know, in the park, um, you can start to see that you could build up a regular kind of influx of, of confusing data into your phone records. And that might have interesting consequences for the way that identity is measured. Um, critics of this, uh, of, of wanting to do this, I've presented these two things, kind of uh, some anonymity and some deniability as, as uh, relatively good things, but I think a lot of people would say if you have nothing to hide, why would you seek these things out? Um, the sort of normal narrative. Uh, and what I'd like to do next is to just sort of make a case for um, uh, having deniability and having anonymity as being very normal historically. So it's not something that we're seeking out that's new, but something that's always been there that is just being whittled away at the moment. That sort of slow death of the phone box as it's replaced by mobile phones, I think demonstrates that we're moving away from systems of like everyday anonymity and communication. Another great example like the phone box is the post box. So the post box is just a hole somewhere you know, out in the world and there's lots of them and you can choose any one and you just walk past it and casually slip something in and there's almost no record of you doing that. So it creates a very similar kind of anonymity to the, the free payphone. Um, when you post a letter, the address of the receiver is, is known in the system, but the uh, identity and the address of the sender is, is a little bit more ambiguous. You could watch every uh, post box, you could look for writing style and those things that came later, but when post boxes started, they were definitely a system of anonymous communication, this one directional anonymous communication. What effect did that have? Well, in the 1800s, um, there was a boom in pseudonym use. Uh, it was used a lot by authors uh, writing books uh, in a number of different really inventive ways. Um, so uh, the Bronte sisters used the postal system um, to hack the male-dominated publishing world and publish incredibly uh, inventive and creative texts um, through that system, and when they finally went to visit their publishers after they'd become a success and revealed the kind of big reveal that they were these sort of timid uh, looking uh, uh, women authors, um, there was of, of course that kind of surprise in the reveal, and they were then able to change the system and build that change more permanently into, into publishing. Um, similarly, in America, um, newspaper writers, this is Charles uh, Farrar Brown, who created this character, Artemis Ward, and he wrote newspaper articles under the character and really sparked the whole kind of era in the 1800s uh, of pseudonymous uh, newspaper writing um, that was used a lot for entertainment. Uh, Mark Twain was another pseudonym inspired by um, Artemis Ward. Um, but the pseudonymity, as well as being a form of entertainment, also allowed um, political critique, critique um, whistleblowing, um, all of the things that we associate with um, functioning anonymity and pseudonymity uh, today. Um, just to give you another couple of quick examples, um, this is... Uh, um, 
uh, Malta Tuli, um, uh, pseudonym for uh, Edward Dowes Decker, uh, who is a Dutch uh, author who used a pseudonym and used these kind of systems of anonymous communication through um, postage and, and uh, passing off to, to friends. Um, he created an incredible, uh, incredibly cutting uh, critique of Dutch colonialism that really shifted the conversation forward dramatically at the time, uh, uh, again in the kind of late uh, 1800s. Um, but this uh, tool of the anonymous communication system in the post box also allowed it uh, for great creativity. Um, so this is Nicholas Bourbaki. This is a group of mathematicians who came together, created a single identity, and wrote quite a creative approach to um, set theory and mathematics using, again, the anonymous communication afforded to them, sort of a guarantee of an an anonymity, to over a number of years publish a series of mathematical texts um, that changed perspectives on mathematics at the time quite dramatically by um, kind of pooling their efforts and publishing under a, a single name. So the case I'm making uh, in those couple of slides is that pseudonymity and anonymous communication of this sort is very common. And I think perhaps um, given its, its multitude of uses, um, I probably don't need to persuade you much in this room, but elsewhere we meet, need to keep having that conversation about why that is a useful thing to keep uh, sustaining. Um, and I think that it is difficult to sustain it. This is the response to the now deleted tweet which revealed the uh, pseudonym that J.K. Rowling uh, was using at the time uh, to write crime fiction. And so the kind of effects of storage and processing and networking um, are changing the ways that pseudonyms can work. And so I think it's important for us to keep investigating as the talks in the, the last two days have started to pull apart how we can uh, maintain levels of anonymity in terms of communication in social contexts to, to keep the possibilities of, of doing this open. Uh, why do we need that? Um, well, the case doesn't really need to be made, but clearly um, anonymity and pseudonymity play a, a continuous role in the kind of powerful work of whistleblowing, particularly whistleblowing of primary evidence, like the um, evidence of, of torture uh, in Abu Ghraib. Um, and uh, uh, the... the um, role of these tools in, in the kind of work of superheroes is, is important for us to be celebrating and thinking about what we do next in terms of the technical tools, but also the culture that surrounds the tool, the way that we present it to people. And that's what I want to talk about next. So this is the advice uh, published a couple of years ago in Wired of how to leak to the press. And the piece that I want to point to in the middle is uh, then you go to a coffee shop that has open Wi-Fi and then you set up an email account and, and, and do your leaking. Um, now, coffee shops with open Wi-Fi, the other things that turn up quite often are um, libraries with public access, um, free Wi-Fi, civic Wi-Fi, um, campus Wi-Fi sometimes. Those things get discussed as the ways that you can um, do what you used to do with a phone box, go and tip off an, a journalist or um, uh, the police about something that you want to tell them about without necessarily identifying yourself. The narrative is now around these places that have free Wi-Fi. Um, but over time, what I'm seeing is a shift in the control of uh, identity around connecting to the web. Um, in the UK, the library login, the campus login, and more and more obligation on businesses and private owners of, of Wi-Fi um, are that you need to check identity before you allow someone to connect. And so the um, conversation about the public benefit of free Wi-Fi versus this kind of um, uh, um, uh, shifting of responsibility and closing down of, ac of access to uh, anonymous connectivity um, seems to be kind of shifting in favor of, of no anonymity, um, which is problematic. Um, our public spaces are sort of being stripped of um, the kind of messiness that allows all of those things we've just talked about in terms of creativity and critique to happen by kind of locking down identity to every kind of access point to this um, kind of immense interesting space that we call the internet and the web. Um, and so what I'd say is that this de demonization of, of anonymity when it works is, um, is always going to happen. So um, 
And the problem is that any functioning pseudonymity tool um, uh, can always be used as a threat against um, powerful corporations and governments that know they're doing wrong, those that are. And so there will always be a conscious and subconscious attempt to demonize those technologies, whatever they are originally designed for. And so there's this constant kind of issue about the way that you describe and present the pseudonymous and anonymous tools that you're making for communication in terms of trying to present them in, in ways that won't be demonized. Um, and so, really, for me, that comes to this idea of how do you design for pseudonymity? Sort of alongside the idea of creating technical tools through cryptography that allow for anonymous communication, how do you design the sort of culture around it, the cafe of people who are sharing their phone minutes to allow anonymity to happen? How do you make that space acceptable to people so it can be sustained and, and be ongoing? Um, and I don't think the superhero analogy that I've pitched at the beginning of this talk and through it um, is really the one to draw on, because that's just the other extreme to the terrorists and the paedophiles. It's just kind of, we sort of end up having this debate at either end of the spectrum, and really we should be in the middle somewhere around all of those uses from the past, around sort of everyday use, the just kind of general dependence on these tools as something that's a useful part of our society. Um, and the, as someone uh, mentioned, I think it was Nadia uh, he Henninger yesterday, she said, uh, we need to normalize burner phones. And you know, even the term burner phones is sort of appealing to the subculture of, of the sort of conversations we have here, rather than kind of thinking about how it would fit into everyday use. But the idea of normalizing, I think, is an interesting one. One way to do that is to be playful, but then play, play can also be sort of pushed to the sideline. And so the kind of hacker narrative can be quite play, playful. The art narrative that I used to present this idea originally also sort of struggles a little bit from that. You know, people can sideline side it as just art. And really the question is, how do we put it into the everyday? So first of all, um, what do we love about phone boxes? Um, the thing that I think phone boxes represent to us is a, is a, is a, a space to escape momentarily. Um, you're still part of the public space. It's not a, a dark box kind of sealed away entirely. You can see what's going on around you, um, but you also um, have some privacy for a moment. Um, they often feature in films as a connection to a loved one, uh, um, something you use when you've just arrived somewhere new, a connection back to the known. Um, they're a, a sort of um, universally familiar. And um, a lot of countries have sustained that by having policies that enforce phone boxes being in all parts of the country. So it's sort of a common good, it, almost by design. Um, and they're also, um, you know, actually reasonably private. So, you know, there is some sound leakage and technology in terms of spying might change our relationship to those physical spaces. But historically, they were a, a relatively private space, a door you can close, a space that you make your own. Um, I want to represent both sides. So what do we dislike about phone boxes? Well, I think one issue is um, that they are often broken. And so they're sort of independable uh, resources. Um, another one is that they um, might contain sex adverts. If you go to London, the phone boxes in the center of town near the business district are sort of smeared with the glue of many years of adverts for phone sex. Um, and uh, they're also, um, sometimes they smell of urine. Um, which, you know, to begin with seems like a terrible feature, but perhaps sort of suggests that people find them private enough that you can do that private thing. Um, so, you know, maybe that's a feature in disguise. Um, and also, historically, occasionally, they've been linked to bomb threats. Um, you know, the anonymous tip-off can also be the anonymous bomb threat, which, again, we can think in the analogy to the remailer is a reason that a number of remailers were shut down was through this kind of connection to bomb threats. And so we have to struggle with this relationship with how technologies and systems are presented. Um, and the direction that I think we should go is to um, think about this in terms of social use and public space. Um, so one thing that I like about the idea of rather than talking about free Wi-Fi, and there have been a number of very admirable and in some ways you know, reasonably successful projects over the years to open up Wi-Fi networks. There's one that was launched this year or last year that again is attempting to make home networks a, a, a free open Wi-Fi system. 
Uh, and I, you know, I think that's the direction that we should be going. But to have that conversation with people who are just coming to Wi-Fi as a concept um, through the the use of their iPhone, you know, for the first time, um, talking about free Wi-Fi, the, the the fear that a stranger will hide outside your house and and use it for nefarious. Uh, means is always going to outweigh, outweigh the altruism of, of wanting to, to do some sort of public good. Um, but if we talk about phone calls rather than data, um, so if we talk about lending a stranger your phone, that is um, still a reasonably socially acceptable thing to do. If someone comes up to you and asks, you know, I'm stuck uh, and I need to contact home, you know, lending them your phone seems reasonable. It's still a thing that socially we accept as a group. And so we can play with the fact that although phone calls are now just data, like any other kind of data, um, the fact that we socially hold those in, in higher regard than we do the other kinds of data in terms of lending and giving uh, and, and altruism, I think allows us to have a different kind of conversation that I think something like this free phone, bo proje phone box project does is allow us to, to go in that direction. Um, and uh, the other thing that I think um, the uh, phone example does is it raises in our minds this idea of digital possessions. So uh, advertising and contract um, uh, packages um, by mobile phones uh, over the last few years have focused heavily on um, giving you free minutes, like free minutes and free texts being part of what you're getting uh, for paying this monthly fee. And what's that, what that has done is emphasize the idea that this kind of abstract um, sort of digital number, you know, because basically providing text, for example, is very cheap for the network, but they've kind of um, sort of uh, walled it off and created a piece of property that they've then given to you. Um, and possessions, I think, is a much better word than property. So the intellectual property debate is bound up in control systems of um, corp corporate control um, on uh, everyday use. But possessions are much more personal. And if we have this conversation about your possessions, your free minutes, and what you want to do with them, I think we start to have a, quite an interesting conversation about kind of control and use of technology. Now, I'm sure buried in many... Um, Phone contracts, if not now, then if this free payphone idea caught on would be this clause that said you can't just give your free minutes over to a system that gives them to someone else because they're not actually yours in the minds of a phone company. They're just a kind of allure. But they still they feel very much like yours, like your possessions, um, and they do to a lot of people. So I think there's an interesting kind of tool there to enter this debate around control uh, of digital technology. Uh, that kind of narrative, I think, extends um, quite nicely. Now, um, the phone lending, uh, there's definitely a higher level of altruism, um, but people also have fears about phone lending. Um, and the kind of standard fear, I think, which is probably um, quite right in this kind of context, is if you hand someone your phone, you're handing them all of your personal data. And so um, I think, again, this idea of a, a payphone that, that arbitrates in that process, you're lending someone your phone without handing over the physical artifact and, and access to your, your personal information. Um, I'm sorry, this is running a little bit slow. Um, I think sort of detracts a little bit from, uh, from the experience um, but uh, I think we can um, use the, the um, strong sort of feeling uh, of people's perspectives on, on phone lending to outweigh these kind of niggling fears to a certain extent. Um, and so the questions really uh, that we come to is um, creating a free phone box that's sustained by a room full of people um, opens up a conversation about digital access and communication that includes these elements of anonymity and deniability um, with a much larger community of people. If you install the phone in the right place, in a, in a, um, in a, a popularly used park uh, or cafe or library, um, the benefits of pr providing free phone calls and of a community sustaining a resource together, um, I think quite easily outweigh in people's minds the, the kind of niggling fears um, 
Uh, what I'm interested in proposing this project here today is how people might counter that, how this kind of inevitable demonization might happen. I'm kind of interested in studying how that conversation will go. The direction that I've thought about already is the obvious one, that someone walks into this uh, space, um, uses the free payphone to place a bomb scare, uh, and that starts to kind of um, cut away at this idea that we're just creating this common good. But I think there's a, an interesting balance in the fact that Bluetooth has this short range, which means that it becomes a sort of social negotiation. So just like using a payphone on a street corner, although you're anonymous, you're also on view. And so there's kind of a, a form of anonymity that's not absolute. Um, often, when we think about um, cryptography, it's, it's very binary. It, it either works or it's totally broken. And I think by placing these um, tools back into a social negotiation, something interesting happens that um, I'd be interested to try and see whether we could map that to other um, sort of environments and, and communication systems. Um, the, the kind of two other ideas that sort of sprung to mind for me um, from this idea of altruism um, is taking that idea of charitable giving further. So um, in terms of kind of deconstructing the way that digital identity seems to be more and more sort of um, stuck into these kind of network systems and archives, um, one of them is to ask the question, what does anonymous charitable giving look like? So if, if you... Um, want to, as people do now and have for hundreds of years, donate to a cause with a, without saying who you are, you have to strip away your identity from that financial tra transaction. And all of the records that are being put in place to track um, uh, uh, money start to um, kind of come up against this sort of tradition of charitable giving. And I think it's a good case where you could take the upper hand by asking how do we still give anonymously to charities. The other question I want to leave us with um, is, um, how do you give to people who have nothing, including any form of auth authentication? So at the moment, giving things to people who live on the streets or um, have lost everything is quite easy um, because you can just give them physical things. You could give them money that's an anonymous currency that they can spend somewhere else. But if we bind uh, money and resources and access to uh, uh, welfare and benefits into identity systems, how do we maintain giving to people who've lost access to those? We can talk about biometric fingerprinting, but I think you know that conversation, again, provides the upper hand. And, and um, for me, this talk has been about um, learning about what kind of social context could you create in order to um, talk about the things that we're talking about every day in, in these kind of contexts and these kind of conferences about anonymity and about pseudonymity working well, but placing them into a social context. Thank you very much. So, so uh, thank you very much. And I have to say something. Um, the IRC and the internet and Twitter want to say a big thank you to you and to tell you this talk was awesome. So, one thing. Also, a thing that was uh, often noticed, your t-shirt is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, IRC. So, for our Q&A, we have um, a lot of questions from the internet. And maybe we have some questions from here. So, line up behind the microphones where we start with some internet questions. Hello again from the IRC. Um, besides being an awesome talk, there are many, many questions um, on all levels, like practical questions on how it does work, but also on law and like uh, politics behind it. So, I start with the more technical ones um, and maybe just um, sum, summing them up so you can just uh, explain the technology behind it a little bit um, together. Like um, they ask whether it's possible to always uh, not send the caller ID um, from the person um, who borrowed the phone or the phone minutes. Um, whether it's possible to also share international uh, calls if the contracts allow it. Um, whether there's a limit for the minutes um, somebody wants to share and whether they have to activate it um, every time. Yeah, that's... Um, yeah, okay. So, um, the pairing, um, what I did with the, the Python scripts was to, um, um, when I recognized a new phone entering the Bluetooth range, 
was to immediately um, identify it as trusted and to give it the same pin for everyone. And so the effect for people entering the room, entering the cafe, was very much like pairing with a, a cheap um, headset. It just had a default pin, and you just choose it from the menu and pair it. And then that pairing lasts, so Bluetooth has a sustained kind of identity, and I maintained uh, a list. I wondered about whether this system should maintain a list of donor phone numbers over time or whether it should have some sort of purging system. I think I would err on the side of purging given that one of its sort of properties is this kind of property of anonymity. Um, but there's some balance there, maybe kind of over a, 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 a some period you would choose to delete. Um, international calls, I've not in the UK seen many um, free minute uh, plans that include international calling, but I think with the shift in EU regulation around cheaper international calls within the EU, maybe there'll be some motivation for that to change. Um, <clears throat> I've also seen a lot of plans recently that have shifted from some free minutes to unlimited minutes, and I think there's an interesting dynamic there for a few years before we entirely shift over to WhatsApp and, and the other um, kind of calling systems um, to kind of play with those free minutes in interesting ways. Um, the uh, um, final point about um, caller ID, uh, I thought about trying to um, find, I think that the problem is that each mobile phone company has different protocols for how you turn on um, kind of anonymizing the outgoing call. And so I didn't come up with a, a kind of simple, easy way to do that. Um, I, I thought about putting uh, up instructions for people to do it themselves, but in the end, I just kind of put a note to say that these kind of IDs would be passing through. The other idea I had was to run a system um, uh, like uh, Asterix that would, when you placed a call, mention to the person before the call was put through that, that this kind of exchange was happening. So you'd kind of frame it in a context. But again, I think that sort of overcomplicated it. Okay, um, we have two people at the microphones and we have a lot of more questions um, from the internet and I think I will just start with you, Mike One, because I don't want to see you standing there much longer. <laughs> uh, hi, I have um, actually two questions, but they are short. Uh, first question is uh, what kind of if information is uh, on the telephone of the person who is giving the minutes, to, uh, free minutes. And the second question is actually tied to the first question. Uh, have you, uh, do you know what kind of legal issues a person that is giving uh, their minutes uh, may have if uh, their minutes are used uh, to of journalists or somebody like that? Uh, I, I don't know the legal implications of, of a phone being used uh, in a number of ways. Um, <clears throat> I think in the UK, the one kind of hard and fast rule is that if you're a phone service and someone tells you about a bomb plot, you have to immediately report it. But because you don't have access to the call as a donor, I think there's, there's kind of an interesting gray area that probably hasn't been um, fully investigated. Um, the first question about uh, your control and the record of the call passing through your phone, um, uh, you can, of course, just turn off the um, Bluetooth connection at any time you want. So you can disrupt a call. Uh, on most phones, when I watched it happening in the cafe, um, the, the phone wouldn't necessarily even switch on when it was routing the call because it's used to being sort of in this mode where it's in the car, you know, and you're using the, the hands-free kit or something. So actually the phones tended to stay quite kind of mute, screen off, no vibration or anything when the call was in progress. Um, I suppose, you know, on some phones you might be able to turn on speakerphone and it would kind of uh, mirror the call. But because you're constrained by the range of Bluetooth, um, you know, you'd be in the same room as the person making the call in the phone box, so it could be awkward. Um, so <clears throat> there's some kind of uh, sort of constraint in that in that direction. Okay. Um, so for another question from the internet. Yes, it's uh, also related to that. Um, <coughs> it's in terms of uh, lawful intercept and how that impacted your uh, phone box idea. Uh, phone box idea, like like. Do you think about that, or does anybody from uh, uh, interception teams already contradict you, or like does it 
at all influence you? Uh, I don't know too much about Lawful inter Intercept. Um, <clears throat> I guess the idea is that you pick a, a phone to target and you ask permission to target that phone. Yes. So a system that's shuffling your calls out to strangers would do interesting things um, to trying to track one person's conversations. Um, I imagined uh, originally that perhaps rather than uh, a phone box in a physical location, you could build this into a phone. So there would be an app that would allow your phone to be the the um, headset and another phone to be a donor and you could run the same kind of system just on a, on a train by turning your phone into a certain mode. And then you could see this pro proliferate into lots of different social uh, um, spaces and, and conventions. Um, but the sort of Bluetooth programming foo um, to get that to work is kind of beyond my grasp at present. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, mic two. Please. Hi. Um, once again, really nice idea. I really like the aspect of uh, mixing connections between people socially. Um, probably have, um, what I see as a problem from the usability part is that I need to go and use and basically number uh, use the number myself. And you have 10 numbers in the UK, for example. Um, just if you thought about a way to make it easier, maybe use two Bluetooth devices and I can use the one um, as a headset, but actually it's using the other one which goes to another phone or something like this. Yeah, I thought about it. I think it would be quite easy to do. You would just kind of need two Bluetooth dongles. Um, so one person's using their mobile phone as the handset mm -hmm. and another person's using their mobile phone as the donor. And yeah. this kind of thing's just creating the intermediary. Um, although, you know, this talk was a love letter to phone boxes. And I quite yeah. like the physical aspect as well of having to go stand up and stand in a space uh, yeah, and kind of use it. the handset. But um, yeah, no, I think that idea has more um, longevity in it. You know, because I don't remember a single phone number nowadays and <clears throat> 10 years ago I used to. Me so. too. And people would get their mobiles out to like exactly. copy out the phone number yeah, into yeah. the handset just to try it out. So, you know, clearly that's not going to function. But then I also like this idea that you're not having to rely on a digital track, you know, if you went back to remembering some key numbers, you could go to the service with nothing, you know, just your memory True. or a piece of paper. And there's something nice about that dynamic as well. True. So yeah. I'm kind of torn. Yeah. Because, yeah, cool. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Um, the internet again. Yes. Yeah, so we have another question that goes more into the anonymity part of it and also about like, um, yeah, law enforcement maybe. Um, because um, Jacob Applebaum, he's a um, security person, like you all know him, I don't yeah. have to explain. Um, he believes that every phone call is being voice fingerprinted, and at least in Spain, um, and probably if you look at all the other interception methods, maybe also in the rest of the world. So there's a video online um, of a talk that he gave last year in uh, Berlin in Seabase, um, where he mentioned that this is possible, that you can just uh, hear a voice and then just say which person it is, so interception would be even more um, possible. How does this um, yeah, interfere with your project, or what do you think about that? Yeah, I think, uh, so voice fingerprinting, of course, um, totally breaks um, the kind of uh, promise of anonymity uh, using voice as a form of communication, uh, if it's your own voice. Um, uh, I wonder about the success of, of voice fingerprinting. I think it will be a partial success, even uh, in well-funded government uh, systems, um, because of the ambiguities of the way that the voice works. At the moment, you can hear I'm suffering from a cold, and I think that does things to the dynamics of, of tone, maybe, maybe not. Um, uh, in the longer term, I've been thinking about other ways of designing for pseudonymity. And for me, the Borbaki group, Nicholas Borbaki, uh, created by that group of mathematicians, is an interesting route to think in. Um, they were many people performing a single character. And when you mix many people into one uh, identity, what you get is a mix of different uh, fingerprints. And that sort of blurring of fingerprints together is not chaff, but this kind of other sort of layering up of, of multiple identities. And I wonder whether that starts to mess with fingerprints. I don't know a way of, do a way of doing that with voice uh, on its own, but it's something, a direction that I've been thinking in for other forms of communication, like writing. 
I mean, it's a big problem also for browsers and everything. So <laughs> yeah, one yeah. thought I've had is that they're just um, directly uh, correlated between how much identity you know, sort of uniqueness you can have and how anonymous you can be. So you can either say something with meaning um, or, you know, you can be anonymous. Maybe there's just, you know, you can only have one or the other. You can just say arbitrary things um, and no one will know who you are or you can make a point, but then something will give you away. Maybe you're just kind of tied. You can have one or the other, which would be sad, but perhaps. I mean, as always, it's also depending on the threat level you face. So uh, I have still questions. So uh, one is, where can we buy the t-shirt? Um, <laughs> it's a beautiful t-shirt. So uh, this is um, from uh, David O'Reilly. I'm terrible at remembering names, but I think that's right. He's the animator um, who uh, has made a number of very beautiful animations that you should seek out online. And he has a t-shirt store called something like um, Stupid Things or... Um, I'll, I'll put a link up on the talk page. Um, but yeah, they're all beautiful. They're all badly drawn. This one's called Mouse Character, which is, you know, lovely on another level. Yeah. Awesome, thanks. I'll just post the last question and then we can close with the room. Okay, great. So it's a more technical question again, or more uh, mobile phone carrier question. Um, because, I mean, it's forbidden for um, many people to share their internet connection by tethering from the phone to their computer or to other people's computers. Um, are there any th similar things for um, minutes? And do you have any feedback from carriers or from people um, talking to you about that? No, I've not had feedback. I don't think anyone's thought about it. So at the moment, I imagine the restrictions aren't there in most cases. Um, some people may, you know, some carriers may argue that some other restriction could apply in this case. But I think because the weight of um, the phone lending idea is quite strong, I think perhaps if, if it were to catch on, there would be this interesting um, kind of dynamic that you don't get with um, the... Um, Uh, um, data sharing where it's really only something that the people in this conference might, you know, sort of understand. Um, the conversation about can I lend my phone to a stranger is one that, you know, um, I know lots of people who don't care about technology would be willing to fight for. Um, so I think there's an interesting dynamic there. Is there one more question there as well? Yeah, thanks. Uh, to me, uh, your project looks like a, a tour to a degree. Yeah. Uh, so First thing, uh, did you ever consider creating a mesh like uh, Tor did? And second thing is, uh, did you think, oh, well, can you explain it to me, how, how you protect yourself from, uh, well, uh, uh, a person that, that's a donor and wants to, to create some statistics about your calls or whatever? Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's, it is a mixed network like Tor. Uh, it's only one node though, and I think kind of chaining them up is, um, cumbersome and also, uh, you know, might as well just be done through kind of Tor. Like, why do it through physical systems when you could just kind of route it through Tor? Um, maybe there's a reason to do it through physical systems, but I don't know. Um, Uh, in terms of protecting yourself from malicious donors, uh, one property of the system is that it's selecting people at random from the social space that you're in. And so, um, you know, if your strategy was to make lots of calls, then you're kind of spreading your bets a little bit in terms of analysis, traffic analysis. Um, but like uh, Tor and other mixed networks, if, you know, someone were to fill your cafe with at least 50% you know, malicious donors, um, then they would be able to, to traffic analyze you, but then you'd have a pretty boring cafe. So, you know, whatever, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, uh, we have time for one or maybe two another more questions. So on mic two. Uh, could you uh, speak about what happens with incoming calls and SMS messages on donor phones? Um, so the... the um, The way that I handled it for the for the um, exhibition, the F uh, city fictions, was just to deny them when they came in. Um, so what <clears throat> what that means is that people would be missing calls um, on their phones, and then they would see the call in the log and could just ring back later. But it didn't call through the handset, so there was no way that um, <clears throat> things would come back to the uh, 
the phone uh, box. The SMSs just arrive as normal. They're not passed on to the headset. Um, if you were using the SIM access profile, then there would be this kind of transfer of data, but with the, the um, hands-free profile, it's just the calls that get passed through. Um, that's not ideal for people to lose incoming calls. Um, and it's also slightly confusing for someone who gets called through this system and rings back uh, immediately because they see this unusual number. So there's some kind of interesting dynamic there, which again, I was thinking about trying to solve with the asterisk server that would leave a message saying, hey, you've just been rung by this person using a donor phone, you know, a stranger's phone, you might call it. Um, they, you know, they couldn't reach you, they'll try again later or something, um, but yeah. Well, but for me, it would be not, uh, I, I would not hand over control over incoming calls to a system that's uh, unknown to me, so. Yes, yeah, there's a lot of issues with, with um, <coughs> trust, um, but it turns out that there's a lot of issues with trust in Bluetooth more generally. Um, I, I think <laughs> the, the strategy would be to, um, to make this phone box a shared resource in terms of maintenance. So you wouldn't need to open the project, but of course, you know, how do you guarantee the software and the hardware is just the eternal question uh, in, in conferences <laughs> like this. But yes, um, pairing with a headset seems reasonably benign uh, in comparison to like SIM pairing. And you can see on, on modern phones, which kind of pairing feature you're opting for. And um, uh, you can therefore choose you know, how much control you're giving. But yeah, you know, a malicious version of this payphone could just ring premium rate numbers, you know, as fast as it can go um, through all of the donor phones at once or something, you know, but yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have, have do we have more internet questions or? No, we don't have any more internet questions, but it just, just came to my mind. I was uh, recently in Cairo in Egypt and there's uh, the tradition or the, the using of um, strangers' phones all the time. Like, like everybody just asks you, can I um, borrow your phone for a minute? I have to call somebody. So I found this quite relatable. Yeah, great. I think it's, a, it's got a long history in lots of places. So um, hopefully that lends some kind of momentum to, to using it as a lever back into the conversation of other things like Wi-Fi as well. So thank you so much, also from the internet again. Thanks a lot. So.